Hey, Sherry. How's it going? Good. So we're going to talk today about um, an essay uh, by Sergei Bulgakov. I think that's how you say it, right? I hear different pronunciations. Yeah. Um, and it's from his book, The Sociology of Death, uh, which is a collection of essays. And it's the essay, actually, which has the same title as the book that we're going to discuss, which is called The Sociology of Death as well. Um, and I don't know. It seems to me that a lot of the stuff in this feels really timely. Um, I'm trying to think how to introduce Bulgakov. Um, um, he's an Eastern Orthodox. I don't even know that he was a priest. I think he was, he was, he was a lay. A oh, was he? he? Was okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I don't know a lot about him, but, um, I, I, I've heard his name come up through kind of other thinkers that I've been engaging with, uh, John Milbank, uh, Catherine Pickstock, um, who else? Uh, Michael Martin, who we've been talking about and who's yeah. written a book about sociology that we're, we've been discussing kind of, uh, off and on. And, um, yeah, in this, this essay for me, it's, it's a really long essay and it's, it's kind of dense and hard to get through in a certain sense. Yeah. I, I have, when I, when I do philosophical readings like this, I like to read them out loud. I actually will record myself just so I can listen back to it. Um, but it's, um, for me, I was, I think when I was first talking to Nate about this, I mentioned for me, this is like the only thing I've read that really goes deep in terms of trying to take seriously both the incarnation um, and the Trinity and the cross yeah. and pull all those things together in a really like, so those things are all talking to each other at once, which I've never really seen that done before. Um, and um, those are all issues that I have, you know, lots of questions about. So it's, this has been really interesting for me to go through and, and, and look at. Um, any, any initial impressions you've had in terms of just like, yeah, I just pulled remember. off as a person or, or any things you've heard about him or just how you feel as you're reading his prose? I haven't really, I don't really know much about him personally. Um, I did read um, someone um, who was with him when he died, wrote a little thing about his death and how, how it was very peaceful and while there was, you know, they talked about him glowing and, you know, that, you know, that I read that about him. I don't know much about his growing up years. Uh, apparently he was, I think he was in the military. He was an atheist. Um, I, he had to have been in communist Russia or at least, yeah, he was in communist Russia. Yeah, he was, he was at one point a Marxist himself. Right, then... right, yeah. I, I think that. he had a, an atheistic turn in his youth and yeah. was a Marxist and <clears throat> became a Christian again and but still had certain aspects of Marxism that he he still held in terms of some of its its aims um I think I'm not sure if it was you or uh Nate that said that he had a kind of a a beginning of his conversion experience was when he was standing in front of a icon of the Virgin, the Theotokos. Oh, I hadn't heard that story. That would, consciousness. I'd love to I hear that story. That um, yeah, he didn't actually convert. Like he was still very much a Marxist at the time, mm -hmm. but it it impacted him in such a way that it he felt like that was the beginning of something, right? Yeah, yeah and then. Um, there's a, um, John Milbank has an introductory video that he gives a lecture on Bulgakov, just kind of like trying to give an overview of him. And one of the things he mentions is that for, in his sort of ontology, it's, he uses grammar as the basis of his ontology versus a, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to logic, which is kind of modernity's bent, which is to try and kind of diminish everything to an either ordness um i i just remembered where i heard that story <laughs> just, just okay clarification <laughs> my brain is not working very well um it was a it was a, a talk that andrew luth father andrew luth luth gave on Bulgakov. okay so just to, so that it's not just 
something that I'm thinking <laughs> or made up. But so that was that was kind of what turned him back from his atheism was in interaction with Daikon. Well, yeah. Lukov himself makes the statement that he felt like something shifted at yeah. that moment. But um, which is really interesting because the Theotokos and sophiology just go hand in hand, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, I shared um, with you that Catherine Pickstock video the other day. Did you ever dive into that at all? Because she mentions is, him in that video too. Yeah, what is truth? Yeah, I've I've been watching it over and over. Um, and, I'm trying to remember what she it. how she puts it. She 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 talks about both Bogakov. Okay, she says, and this other guy Rosmini, who's an Italian Catholic. She says, as Christian thinkers made the radical suggestion that even God, being a Trinity, sustains in the infinite the grammatical shuffle between subject, predic predicate, and copula. And I think I think copula is just the verb part of the sentence, but yes. like this, like this, the subject and the object or the predicate and the the verbal action between them. Um, which I found that very interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's you know, yeah, this this pattern of the Trinity is is just everywhere. You know, you, you find these everything seems to come in in these threes, right? To be actually functional. Um, like what's a sentence if it's just full of nouns? It's just a list. You yeah. know, it's not a it's not a cohesive thought or um, you know, with any of those things that she talks about, the subject predicate and the verb, there you only have being when they're all working together, right? Yeah. Um, well, it, whenever whenever you can reduce something to logic, you have it becomes trivial. It becomes mm -hmm. kind of, it doesn't point to anything larger than itself. It's kind of just like, you know, it's a tautology of just kind of like self-referential, like, you know, A is A. It, 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 that's, that's essentially what the mathematical logic kind of boils down to. It's just a kind of static well, she also identity. Points out, she also points out in that video that, uh, you know, the foundation for, for all of grammar is, is, is being itself, like the verb to be, right? She, she makes that reference to, um, um, you know, she hit the, she hit the baseball with the bat. Well, it's actually, she is hitting, right? Yeah. The so there's, there's a, there's a, yeah, there's a, a ground of being that's an implied in all, in, in all verbal actions. Yeah. 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 Which is, which is really interesting. I liked that. Um, yeah. So, so in terms I, of, I, go ahead. Uh, Sorry. I was, no, I was just going to kick off some thought. of the readings if, if, you, if you didn't have anything else you wanted to go into. Yeah, well, actually, you know, <laughs> it's like I said, my brain is a sieve. I just remembered, I, photo, I, I screenshotted a whole bunch of things out of the book while I was reading it. Awesome. So um, we might just land on similar things, you know. I have a feeling we probably will, but Definitely. Um, we, could do, we could do, maybe you share something, we can talk about it, and then I could share something. That's, that sounds yeah. perfect. Okay. Um, so I'll read the first one here. This, this one struck me. I think this is fairly early on where Can he you, says. Do you have a page number or anything by any chance? If you no, don't, it's, it's like, fine. It's, I don't for this one. I should have wrote it down. Yeah, it's okay. Um, and I have a Kindle version, which unfortunately the page numbers don't, don't sure. mean much because they change when you change right, your right, font right, size. Right. Yeah. But, um, so he's talking about um, why why the cross is necessary. Okay. And he says, a liberation from death by an omnipotent God, by an omnipotent, omnipotent act of God, as a deus ex machina, would have meant the abasement of humanity, the diminishment of its freedom, its reduction to the state of an object passively receiving salvation i.e. the abolishing of human nature itself. Um, I found that really interesting because what, what, I, what I hear in there is that, I don't know, be, I, I hear a, an explanation for me that's always ringing in the back of my head of why, why, is, why is the cross necessary? Yeah. Um, and it, for me, what it, why it's necessary is there is this necessity for human nature to to participate in the act of salvation um, 
such that such that human freedom can be maintained right versus versus god kind of copy pasting some sort of um you know omnipotent decree whereby we are saved yeah right and and of course the whole this whole essay is a meditation on death as the vehicle for that salvific act yeah and um which which is i think in some sense modernity i think we've we've imbibed many christian ethics and principles but that's something i think is is a pill that we don't we we have a hard time swallowing you know death is kind of always pushed to the side it's always something we don't want to think about um we 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 in some sense i think we often have difficult times dealing with other people's deaths mainly because it's a reminder also of our own uh and the inevitability of of that event in our own lives and it's like something that we know we all know you know from the time we're five or six years old you know this is something that we get introduced to and and know our whole lives but it's something we often i think are even actively encouraged culturally to put off to the side and not give much meditation or reflection to yeah so i always i always want to say then why (laughs) why don't we sure it's terrifying you know and we also have this innate sense of self-preservation. Like that's a given, right? That's instinctual mm-hmm. for us to stay alive. Um, and thank God for that. Uh, but at the but same- But stay alive time, to do what? Yeah, yeah. Like why, why, why do we want to push everything out? And perhaps, I mean, I might go so far as to say it's a rejection of God himself. It's a, re- it's a rejection of the transcendent. It's like- um uh, what we were just talking about um people working from home people not you know services being cut in grocery stores self-checkout you know all the all this separation from community which is which is trinitarian in nature right like interacting with our fellow man giving people the opportunity to show kindness and love for one another um it just seems like a it just seems like a, um, a logical next step in the in the worldview that we have, where where we remove death, right, pain and suffering, mostly because that's what we experience um, as those left behind. We experience pain and suffering. The person who's died is gone, right? Like, and and unless the dying was slow and torturous, um, it was probably. Like, well, I, I don't want to say I know how everyone feels when they die, but, you know, I think I, I've watched animals die and, and I, and they're not writhing, they're not screaming, they're not, they're just slowly dying, right? They're, they're, they're completely uh, wrapped up in the actual process of dying. Like, it's, it's a thing that they're doing, you know? Um, yeah, so... But I, I have a quote here that I think might might actually piggyback really well onto what you were just saying, because this is from Bulgakov. Now, I don't have a page number either, so, so. Um, he says here, immortality stands opposed to death. It pre-exists the latter and is presupposed by it as its precondition. If God did not create death, then that means that at man's creation, there existed in him at least the possibility of immortality and that implies that death was not a necessity death as a mere possibility ceased to be a reality and became instead an inevitability on account of original sin nevertheless this inevitability did not exist for did not exist for the only sinless one by virtue of his freedom from sin both original and personal death is sacrificially assumed by him through freedom it is accepted by him for our salvation from death, having trampled death by death. Nevertheless, this freedom cannot operate as the direct coercion of divine despotism over creation or as a new creative act, as it were. It must be ontologically grounded in creation. In other words, in the incarnation and in divine humanity, there must be room, 
dot, dot, dot for death. That's a, a pretty big, <laughs> that's a pretty big statement because he's basically saying in order to, in order to have freedom, you have to have death. In order to have the incarnation, you have to have death. I mean, St. Paul talks about Christ putting on the corruptible, right? Which to me is, is, you know, you could literally translate that as putting on death itself. Because that's what the corruptible is. It's death. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. he talks about in other parts of the essay like that, you know. Well, of course, it's important that God's doing this voluntarily, right? Because he, Jesus, unlike us, he, he has the choice to voluntarily surrender to death versus where we we don't have that voluntary choice we're kind of pushed into it by um by the um the corruption that is entered into the world but he makes a point where he says you know jesus in being born a baby is born a son of adam so he's he's born with the adamic nature and so he he has that along with that adamic nature he has the um that possibility of being of dying right mm -hmm. which which is why you know he makes he talks about earlier you know you when jesus is a baby that you know um herod's trying to kill him and they flee to egypt mm -hmm. which he says is this is demonstrating the fact that yes you know there's there's the possibility that he could actually been killed you know it wasn't right. like just because mm -hmm. he was god he hadn't he came in and um so he he takes on this this creaturely role along with its sort of diminished this diminishment within Adam, although he does, of course, he, he still is able to live in that diminished human capacity and still be sinless and maintain his um, unity with, with the, the father and Holy spirit mm -hmm. throughout his, his, um, his incarnation. Yeah, and even in his death, like uh, Bulgakov, I don't have the quote here, but maybe I could find it. Hang on a second. Um, I, have I, have, I have a real long quote on on the death of the Trinity. Oh, the co-dying? Co yeah. You want to read that? Long. That's actually really great. Sure. Well, it's there's like three or four different parts. To it. It's like, it's, I'd say it's like 60 or 70% of, mm -hmm. of what we talk about. Um <laughs> But yeah, I'll start, I'll start reading some of the stuff I've highlighted. It's all, all of this that I've highlighted goes into this. So he talks about the antinomy of kenosis. And I guess antinomy is like a, a word referring to like kind of opposites that are kind of held in tension with each other. Um, the antinomy of kenosis consists in the fact that the son, while preserving his abiding in the heavens on the throne with the father and the spirit, also during his incarnation lives in the world as man in the process of divinization and only at the end of the journey as a fully as the fully deified man or more precisely the god man and on the paths on and on the paths of this life there is accomplished that acceptance of the entirety of human existence of course without sin the acceptance of suffering and death this acceptance must be understood in the most realistic sense, i.e. not only as the permitting of it and agreement to it, but also as the very exhaust, exhaustion and eradication of death as dying. And he's got a little note here. He says, the verb Bugovkov uses ishit finds no economic translation into English. Here it expresses an eradication that follows upon a full experiencing or living out of some trial such that in our case, Christ eliminates death precisely by exhausting it and fully living through of the process of dying. And then it says, uh, it is a fearsome thing even to utter a thought such as the dying of God. But it is precisely this that the gospel tells us that the revelation attests. And there is no place here for any sort of docetism, the, the acceptance of which would turn our entire hope into a myth. The matter at hand concerns exactly dying and death of God and man 
of the God man. And I think that, 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 so you mentioned docetism there, which was a early Christian heresy about that, that talks about the incarnation as sort of an loose, like an illusion. Like it's not, God wasn't really here because it was, I think it maybe it was associated with some of the Gnostic heresies. I'm not sure, yeah. but it would, it would kind of play with that idea of like, you know, oh, well, God's not really going to dirty himself by, you know, really incarnating and dying. It was, it was all kind of like a, a puppet show to right. teach us um, um, uh, some sort of moral lesson, but it wasn't really, um, it wasn't really God incarnate. And, and this is, Bulgakov is trying to go, I, I feel like a lot of the meditation on death here is, is a meditation on, I would say the depths of the reality of the incarnation, that he's really fully human at the same time that he's fully God. Yeah. Yeah. It's also the process, I mean, it's the process towards theosis, right? It's the, it's the process that every human being has to take um, towards divinization, which is, a, which is an incarnation in and of itself, right? Yeah, like, and, and his point here is that Jesus has to go through that as well, <laughs> that he doesn't like it, he, doesn't, he isn't born a fully deified, you know, in theosis human being he he walks a path to achieving that through his suffering and death mm -hmm. yeah i don't i i haven't gotten that far i guess into the thing um to, to have noticed that for some reason um but there's also i guess i was thinking about i was thinking about the part in there and i can't find it right right now where he talks about the withdrawal of God yeah. at, on the cross and, and yet the, uh, um, the co-dying of, of, of the Trinity, like the, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all experiencing the same thing. And it reminded me of um, Father Bear um, in one of those um, Closer to Truth videos. Um, the guy's trying to understand the Trinity. Like, do they all, like, who's got what job and you know and he said oh you can't think about it like that they all work the same work and the way that you know that definition is i i find it's 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 very simple but it's also um very true whatever the one is doing the other is also doing right um they they're always working the same work and so if christ is dying on the cross then they're they're, they're all dying right and he goes into this, he goes in, Bulgakov goes into this, and I know it sounds very heretical to think, like, to say, oh, God, God the Father died, like, you know, but it's a, it's a, it's a co-suffering, right? It's a co, I don't even know, do you know where it is? <laughs> I wish I could read it right now, because. I can start reading. Uh, the, the, it, it's like literally pages, but yeah. I have it all highlighted. It's, it begins right after oh, the you? quote I just read. Yeah. I was but thinking I'll, about that hypostasis part yeah well i can start reading you, and you can just interrupt me at any point you want to put okay. a comment in and i'll do the same if there's something okay. i find interesting sure um so it says here the the inscrutable mystery of the divine human death unites in itself not only human death but also the dying of god yet in this inscrutability there are revealed to us certain features connected especially to hypostatic triunity the guiding principle in comprehending the inscrutable mystery of the incarnation still remains the fact that it must be comprehended in light of trinitarity. Although it is specifically the son, the second hypostasis who is incarnated, still in taking on flesh, he is not separated from the Holy Trinity, but instead abides in divine union with the Father and the Holy Spirit. This union, indestructible in eternity in the heavens, is also indestructible in its own way in the incarnation as well on earth. And in the incarnation, we find the co-participation of all three hypostases, each in its own manner. The father sends the son, and this sending is an act of, the, of fatherly sacrificial love, the kenosis of the father, who condemns to the cross the beloved son, who in turn takes on himself this feet on the cross. The feet of the son is also the self-denying love of the father, who in sending the son condemns his very self to co-suffering and co-crucifixion, though in a manner different than the Son. Because there is 
the God man's passion on the cross. There's also the fatherly passion on the cross, the passion of co suffering love, of fatherly self crucifixion. We must understand the sending of the Son by the Father not as an act of authority, as a command, but rather as an act of agreement, initiative, organization, or, oh no, not organization, origination, all of which are hypostatically proper to the Father. This sending includes the complete fullness of accepting the God man's passion through the divine fatherhood. Even human fatherhood gives us an image of the oneness of the life of a father and son in their destinies. Despite the wholly limited nature of fatherly and filial love and humanity, still the father and son possess one life, one joy and suffering, although in a different manner. We cannot even say that the son suffers, but the father does not suffer, or that the first suffers more and the second less. Rather, both co-suffer together. The salvation of the world and the redemption, the divinization of man is one act of the father and the son. The son accomplishes the will of the father in this unity of will and of mutual knowledge. No one knoweth the son but the father, neither doth anyone know the father but the son, Matthew eleven twenty seven testifies to the unity of life and the unity of suffering in their common, although distinct for each, kenosis of love. Yeah, that's a lot. So I think that's pretty self-explanatory, actually. I mean, I think we yeah, can it's, understand. It's long, but it's, it's you know, he, he takes it so carefully that you don't think anything gets lost there. Well, he has to. Yeah. And he totally has to, though, because otherwise you're going to you're going to think he's saying something that he isn't saying. And he, he, you know, it's true. Like we know that. If we were to watch a child, our child suffer and die um, in you know the way Christ did, we would we would also suffer and die in that same way. We would have that same experience as a parent. And that's yeah. just on the human level, you know. Um, we would feel their pain. We would, we would feel their abandonment. We would feel all of it. You know, um, I don't think there's any way that you, you couldn't, unless you were twisted and you were actually perpetuating the suffering yourself Yeah. Um, and getting some weird. Yeah. And we, and we even get a taste of that, even in just, you know, hearing or witnessing a well-told story about someone suffering where we, we participate in the suffering to some degree. Yes. But it, you know, and we and we do so kind of in a limited, but it's it nevertheless real fashion. And to to and to some extent, our ability to do that when interacting with you know someone else's story imaginatively is kind of it's limited by our our capacities, right? Our 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 willingness to kind of empty ourselves out temporarily. And, and take on um, a self-identification with, with the person in that story. And it's interesting to me, like, I, I feel like, you know, this is, this happens somewhat effortlessly, even like we're, we're kind of made to do that. Um, which is why we, yeah we really love stories and like, like, you know, it's yeah. watching a movie, a well done movie is kind of like a roller coaster um, because we, yeah, you, you're participating. yeah, you, you, you feel like it's almost like, you know, you, it's funny, I've, I've had this experience of reading like a book, you know, and like, you know, something that's going on in the book, you know, you, you stop reading the book and you, you forget, like you're, you're kind of like at a tension point in the novel and you walk around all day kind of like holding that tension in yourself because like you, it feels so real to you, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, but here we're saying like that, you know, God yeah. who is, never never divided from so never never has a point of of actual division even though as it talks out later there's a certain there's a certain passivity that comes into play where there's a sense of withdrawal relative to um jesus as a human's ability or um to to have a palpable sense of that union that it does, that is diminished. And that, that diminishment itself is a, a critical component of the act of dying that he goes through, which is like a necessary yeah. component. Well, he does, 
yeah, later on in here, he does end up talking about that withdrawal, right? Um, the, um, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? But he, he does, he does a very careful and very well, uh, well, a really good job of, of showing that in that co-dying and co-suffering, um, love is actually being expressed, right? Like that it's, it's, it's an expression of love, right? Um, which if you want to just, you know, again, look at it as a, as a parent with a child, of course, it's the love that compels you to suffer and die with them. If you're seeing them suffering and dying something in some somewhere, the only thing that would, would compel you to co-die and co-suffer with them is love, right? Um, but there was, um, oh, I have a thought now and I, I lost it, but, um, oh, the kenosis thing. I wanted to ask you, um, this emptying, I'm starting to, just reading him, I'm starting to have an understanding of kenosis as not just an emptying. It's not like I have a full jug of water and I dump it down the drain. Now it's kenosis, right? But it's more like a fountain, and just like help me to, to understand if I if I have this right, it's more like a fountain that is just pouring out, um, that it, that is never ending. It's a, it's a, you know, we think of this self emptying as 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 an empty vessel, but I think it's a vessel that is emptying, like that. It's a it's a it's a constant um, action, right? Um, and I kind of see it as a creative process as well. So whatever empties out onto the world is, is something being created at the same time. Yeah. Well, I, I, I feel like this is just my own perspective on this, but it's something I've, I've had kind of as a thought for a while that I think this kenosis is, again, it's, it's happening all the time. It is, it is the very thing, the love, the power that is sustaining creation in every moment. And that right. in some sense, that's why, you know, Jesus again is the lamb slain for the foundation of the world, that there's something in that there's something, there's just something cosmic about it such that it, nevertheless that it happened at a particular place in time and and it's not it's not um it's not a, a sort of puppet show that just was done for our benefit it, it happened really in time nevertheless it's also a, a revelation of a of the even deeper cosmic reality that god the holy spirit and and the son together co-eternally are always experiencing and walking through in their in their relationship to the created order um, that is both sustaining it and giving it direction and purpose and life, but is also, it, it's both a, I see it as both a flowing out and also a sort of, it, it's, it's, it's an opening up of a space as well for us to have real autonomy and freedom and choices in the way the story unfolds and plays itself out. Yeah. And I, I I, I think that's it's the depths of that are so deep. I don't think we have. I don't think it's very easier for us to to look into. But I I think that's for me. Like I think I think you know the whole act of why why does why does the incarnation you know, Jesus every time he's asked about what he's here to do he's like he's like I'm here to share the Father, and the disciples are always going show us the father and we'll believe show us the father. And he's like, you don't understand. I, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. That's this whole thing's about giving you a window into that. And I think that the cross is kind of the pinnacle of that. It's. Um, well, I heard it described and I'm desperately trying to figure out where, <laughs> like I said, my brain is just not working. I think I, I threw it in, uh, in the boxer one day, actually. Um, I can't remember where I read it. Um, that maybe it was Balkakov. There was a description of the tides, um, 
oh man, it really bothers me that I can't remember this, but um, there, you know, Jesus, Jesus, the tide comes in and even when the tide is receding, it still look, appears to be coming in. Yeah. You know, you, you have this tide, tide going, you know, according to the tidal charts, tides going out, but the waves are still coming up against the shore. Right. Yeah. And, um, and he describes whoever I'm trying to quote here <laughs> describes um, Jesus is coming into the world as this shift in the tides. Like it's a metanoia where, damn it. Dude, this is my head right now. Um, I'm getting everything. It's, it's, it's all there, but it's coming out in bits and pieces. So it's, um, Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of him. And he used that as a, as a um, illustration of this tidal thing. So it, at one point it was, it was what was, you know, what was going in and now it's what's coming out. So there's this shift and this shift is this metanoia. Um, but it's, it, it's the evolution of consciousness too, right? Because Oh, it, it, that's where it was from. It was Barfield that said yeah, this. <laughs> because it's saving the appearances, right? Um, before it's in, it is the outward in, right? Like you, you, you don't really, you, you, this, this, this ancient man is so formed by his outside. It's, it's yes. kind of like, you know. Thank you. You know, that's, that's why all these, you know, things like love and, war and all these things are conceived of as the gods because they're kind of things that feel like they don't they're not perceived internally they're perceived externally as as kind of controlling the fates pulling the strings of them right. and then you know there's something something happens ontologically yeah. in terms of where now the individual and you, you can you see this just in the course historically how these these ideas of self-consciousness come into play you know much further down the line and it's the, the the thing to me about all this stuff with barfield and evolution of consciousness that's so interesting to me like i still don't know how to kind of thread is because there's there's all the, there's there's positives that come out of that and negatives and it seems like what are the negatives just out of curiosity well, well the negatives are that we in this in this journey of you know moving out from the community and, and the individual having a real voice, we are, it, it maximizes the contributions of the individual. Like our, our concepts today of like the genius and like, you know, people like Einstein and Newton, other people that were like, make these kind of quote unquote genius discoveries that, that wasn't possible really in those ancient times, right? They could, the individual couldn't come out with this unique perspective that now benefits everybody so that's like the beneficial side i would say but the the negative side is that this this process of individuation just swings to like some maximal place where in the 20th century it leads to like a, a complete the the individual becomes completely isolated and and just and rent from reality itself mm -hmm. so that for so that now even, you know, it's very popular, this idea that we're living in a simulation. Yeah, yeah. And it might even be the case that I'm living in a different simulation than you are. And like, you're like, you're a, you're an NPC in my simulation <laughs> and I'm an NPC in your simulation, right? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's this complete, um, and of course that begins with earlier movements too, in nominalism and Protestantism, you know, which again, they're all further movements where, it's placing emphasis on on the on the subject that the our subjective perspective it's imbuing that in some sense with more power but then at the same time it's it's cutting it off from the the tree of life such that it eventually becomes meaningless right but but imagine now okay i'm just gonna play the devil's advocate here for a minute because if you're living in a completely integrated like communal life, let's say like original participation, for example, you actually don't know who you are. Yeah. 
right? Like that, that is the negative aspect, if you want to call it that, the negative aspect of, of that, right? Well, you are whoever, what everybody identifies you as. You, do, you, right. have, you, have, you have much less, you know, self-authorship in terms of that identity. Yeah, and which, and, and which is good and bad, right? Because like there, then you don't have it's 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 an enormous work of a lifetime to try and construct an identity. So to try and construct it for yourself by yourself is it's an impossible task. So to have sure. the community impress upon you an identity is it actually a gift? Even at the same time that it's actually it's somewhat dictatorial be, and oppressive as well. Right, right. But I mean, all I'm saying is that. From where we're standing in the modern world, we're seeing individuality as as a as a you know big bad monster, right? Um, because because we see people suffering under under the weight of it. Um, but there was there's also the flip side to that in, in that people do suffer under the weight of community. Let's just ask anyone who lives in a tight community what what that's like. You know where where you might not be able to break free of, of the stereotypes within your own community, or they think you are this person, but mm. you know who you are and you're not that person, but how do you tell, you know, we, yeah. we experience that in our families. Right. And so um, like Barfield is pointing out that these two movements are happen. Like to me coming out of community into individuality is like being kicked out of the garden. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's at that point where Adam and Eve go look at, at see their nakedness, right? They suddenly become self-aware. And, um, and it's, and according to the, you know, the first quote that I read here from um, Bulgakov, he says, in other words, in the incarnation and, and in di the divine humanity, there must be room for death. So this process is 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 the process through which we die, I think, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and then the two things, the community and the individual, the unity and the multiplicity, right? The one and the many can can be integrated properly. And it, and it's through death, it's through death that that happens. Um, I mean, we know that um, as an individual in the world, when we marry and commit to living for our spouse, we are immediately confronted with all the things in us that need to die, right? Then we, then we experience it as a parent, you know, um, then we experience it as a mother-in-law, you know, <laughs> then yeah. we, you know, and it just keeps expanding, right? You just keep dying, as the as you know, you are the individual, and the community comes upon you, and the, and together, you 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 become integrated through death. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think that the, the issue is that modernity um, is unable or incapable of seeing death as a good thing because, partially because it doesn't. I, I think we our conceptions of God don't have. God participating with death in real ways. No. I think our our conceptions of God have moved to a place where God is so absent from the creation. And that even our conceptions of the incarnation is sort of like, again, I think, I think the modern conception, even of an evangelical perspective, sees the incarnation as a sort of a puppet show, where it's sort of like an act that's put on. And the depths of of what is being revealed in it are are just completely blown over, which to me, the depths that are being revealed are God's intricate involvement in every detail of community of, of, of creation. And right. it's, 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 it's sustenance in, um, in a moment by moment basis. Yeah. Whereas we don't, I don't, you know, and this is something intellectually I'm convinced of. And yet still, because of the culture I'm, I live in, in, in the, um, you know, just the way I've been raised, et cetera. I still, it's, I struggle to remind myself that that, um, is the case, you know, that what exactly is the case just to, that, just that, to... that God is, uh, here with me at all times everywhere. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Yeah. That he's not, 
he doesn't just show up in certain, you know, places, or I don't, I'm not reaching out to him by some, you know, act of my will that like, you know, that I have to like climb some mountain of, of achievement to get to him like that. Well, I think, that I, you know, like in the middle of this essay, Bulgakov writes, or towards the end, he writes about his experience with death, right? Like his actual experience with almost dying. And, um, and the reason that I think he puts that in there is because in order to understand that God is everywhere, present, filling all things, you have to, you have to get there. You have to get to that yeah. gate. Um, and, and see that that's, that he really is everywhere. <laughs> like it, you know, um, yeah, I don't know how to say it any other way. Um, I, I just think like I've, I've had my own experience in that regard and, um, and he showed up like, you know, like, and, and, uh, and I absolutely didn't think he was going to. You know, like I was convinced that what what I was doing at the time was was um, going to hell, you know, going to get me in hell. Like, that's yeah. what I thought. Right. Um, but I experienced God as co-dying and co-suffering with me. That's how I experienced it. And and um, and I don't think it's easy to understand uh, propositionally, unless you've actually had the experience, like I, I just don't know how. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're describing. Yeah, I, I, I do. Um, it, it's um, yeah, and I don't, I don't. But I think, that, but what you're describing there is is why I've, you know find like reading through this just so moving because it's it's an elaboration of of it's it's words and language for the reality of what you're just describing i think yeah that that god is because 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 this kenosis this this creative act I, again i believe it's god's doing it all the time for yes. everyone that's, and everything yeah. yeah that's why i say it's not an empty vessel it's not an emptying of a vessel it's a it's a it's a fountainhead it's an overflowing it's a never ending right yeah, yeah. and oh. and like just like you you as like a mother you know and you know a, a spouse and all these things that you're there's there's always this sort of dying to self that is necessary for the relationship to be life-giving for the other person yeah and there's even a dying and dying like as you get older as you age and your body starts to give way and you want to go out, it, there's no, there's no reason in here why you can't go climb that mountain or, you know, plow that field all day long or go hunting or get a load of wood, right? There's nothing here to stop you, but this stops you. Yeah. Your body stops you. Right. And th that is the, the ultimate like I've, I've seen, I've seen people age, like I've seen people my age who have now passed away at the age of 90. I've lived that long, right? I met them when they were my age and now they're gone and they died at 91, right? And I watched them die before they died. I watched them die. Um, and there's ways to do it. Like there's good ways to do that. And there's really, really hor horrible hellish ways to do that right um so you know the best arena to die in is 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 the family it's the it's the it's it's a marriage and it's parenthood and it's and it's uh, the extended family and living in that community that is to me that is the place where we get to exercise um dying to ourselves but but then we we enter at some point an arena where it's just us and God. It's just us contending with ourselves, with our bodies, with our lack of our inability. Like we can't remember things, we can't lift that, we can't breathe, we can't. You know, our all our friends are dead. Like seriously, it's it's brutal. It's brutal, and it's another way of dying. Again.
it's it's another arena that you're faced with. Yeah, and of course, I think you know now it. I think it is obviously made worse today because of, again, the culture at large, the mainstream of culture doesn't want to recognize it. It doesn't want to dignify it. No. And so it's, it's almost, I think it's almost looked on as a sort of moral failing almost like, well, Oh, well, you maybe, didn't maybe if you, you know, worked out every day and, yeah. had you had you know these healthy smoothies and took these right yeah. supplements or like yeah. you were more scientifically minded and had all these you know interventions medically and like like you could you could still be here in the in the you know youth focused culture over here you could still be a part of the game but you right. can't so we don't really want to give you too much attention and we want to kind of forget you exist and yeah. hopefully and you can go to some special place that's off to the side to go die quietly where we don't have to watch because we don't, yeah. we don't want it to be true. Um, and, and the same thing applies to, um, you know, children with um, handicaps, right? Um, to care for those children. I know a woman who has two severely handicapped kids. She has three children and two of them are severely handicapped. Like they have to be fed with tubes and they're in, you know, huge fancy wheelchairs and, they can't talk, both of them, and um, and her husband care for them and uh, take them everywhere, and you know. But the world also wants to exclude them, right? The, the, the world also doesn't want to see that, um, and and um, and certainly doesn't want to participate in it because I can guarantee you that as a parent, you are dying all the time to that. You know, that that is making you die <laughs> in a very real way all the time. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. Just talking about this, um, you know, I always feel like. Every time I have a conversation and Jeff makes thumbnail thumbnail for it and sticks it on randos, it's got the word die in it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm so morbid. <laughs> What's happening? But, but it, it, it really, it really seems like that is ultimately what we're called to do, you know, and fi for me finding Bulgakov and, 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 and hearing him reiterate that in such beautiful language, um, and as a priest who has a far greater understanding of these things than I do, um, and Russian one at that because those Russians are, they're different. <laughs> they're a different breed um, for sure. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm just, well, thrilled to say the least, you know, thrilled. Um, because, because for me personally, I always wondered, am I just constantly drawing on my own experience? Like, but then that's what he's doing, <laughs> right? He had this experience and it enlightened him. He saw something when he mm -hmm. had that experience and he saw something very profound. And um, yeah, he talks about being the herald from, from yeah. another world. And there was another part in here. I can't find it right now, but he, he also, he also talks about this cosmic shift when Jesus dies on the cross, you know, he says the rocks split apart and the earth shakes. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember having that thought too, that when, when Christ died on the cross, there was this, and I described it in, in those terms, like there was this, there was this, you know, rip in, in the, in the fabric of reality. Like there was a cosmic shift that happened. And then when I was reading Barfield talking about this turning of the tides, I thought, oh, wow, isn't that interesting? Because this was his, this was his philology and, and the incarnation essay i don't know if you've ever read that but it's it's not very long it's really good um and um there you know what i'm gonna find it really quick because i have it saved and i just want to read you the last paragraph um because this has everything to do with what we're saying here definitely yeah it's um, um well i mean barfield 
Barfield, similar to Bulgakov, is seeing seeing reality as as sort of uh, linked to language. That re, that reality, yeah. And that, that that's kind of the the substance of that Catherine Pickstock, right? Um, video as well. That there's some eternal link between the the structure and content of language and reality itself. That this the two of those are not. There's not. They're not arbitrary that they're actually uh held together by the ground of being god himself is actually holding those two realities together such that we are able to have true thoughts about the world right right and that, and this is his whole essay is called philology and the incarnation right so i'm just going to read this um it's not that long it's a couple of paragraphs but i have to read all of it together um Let me find this good spot here to start. Okay, so he says, and so if it were possible, and of course it is not, that a man should have pursued the kind of studies I have been speaking of without ever having read the gospels or the epistles of St. Paul, without ever having heard of Christianity, he would nevertheless be impelled by his reason to the conclusion that a crucial moment in the evolution of humanity must have occurred certainly during the seven or eight centuries on either side of the reign of Augustus and probably somewhere near the middle of that period. So he's referring back to, oh, here, let me read this. It's, it's short, I'll give you the, um, he leaves his analogy of turning of the tide and um, he says, it's, it's one long sentence, so I can't really break it up. Um, I've been speaking of this reversal in the direction of man's relation to his environment, this change from a period in which, with the help of language, man is drawing his self-consciousness, as it were, out of the world around him, to a period in which he is again, with the help of language, in a position to give back to nature something of the treasure he once took from her. Then a student of the history of word meanings can certainly be as definite as this. He can say with confidence that the great change of direction took place let's say between the death of Alexander the Great and the birth of St. Augustine. Okay, so in that part that I read before, he's referring to that moment in time, right? So this he would, this he would feel from the whole course, course of his studies was the moment at which the flow of the spiritual tide into the individual self was exhausted and the possibility of an outward flow began. This was the moment at which there was consummated that age-long process of contraction of the immaterial qualities of the cosmos into a human center, into an inner world which had made possible the development of an immaterial language. This, therefore, was the moment in which his true selfhood, his spiritual selfhood, entered into the body of a man, casting about for a word to denote that moment, one, what, one would, what one would he be likely to choose? I think he would be almost obliged to choose the word incarnation, the entering into the body, the entering into the flesh. And now let us further suppose that our imaginary student of the history of language, having had up to now that conspicuous gap in his general historical knowledge, was suddenly confronted for the first time with the Christian record, that he now learned for the first time that at about the middle of the period which his investigation had marked off, a man was born who claimed to be the son of God and to have come down from heaven, that he spoke to his followers of the father in me and I in you. And he told all those who stood around him that the kingdom of God is within you and startled them and strove to reverse the direction of their thought. For the word metanoia, which is translated repentance, also means a reversal of the direction of the mind. And he startled them and strove to reverse the direction of their thought by assuring them that it is not that which comes into a man, which defiles him, but that which goes out of him. Lastly, let me further suppose that, excited by what he had just heard, our student made further inquiries and learned that this man, so far from being a charlatan or a lunatic, had long been acknowledged even by those who regarded his claim to have come down from heaven as a delusion, as the nearest anyone had ever come to being a perfect man. What conclusion do you think our student would have been likely to draw? Well, as I say, 
The supposition is an impossible one, but it is possible, I know because it happened in my own case, for a man to have been brought up in the belief and to have taken it for granted that the account given in the Gospels of the birth and resurrection of Christ is a noble fairy story with no more claim to historical accuracy than any other myth. And it is possible for such a man, after studying in depth the history of the growth of language, to look again at the New Testament and the literature and tradition that has grown up around it, and to accept, if you like, to be obliged to accept the record as a historical fact, not because of the authority of the church, nor by any process of ratiocination such as C.S. Lewis has recorded in his own case, but rather because it fitted so inevitably with the other facts that he had already found them, as he had already found them, rather because he felt in the utmost humility that he, if he had never heard of it through the scriptures, he would have been obliged to try his best to invent something like it as a hypothesis to save the appearances. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. It was a lot, but... No, I think, I'm glad you read that. Um, yeah. I think I did read that a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. And so what I, what I liked about it, because I was reading Balga Coffin, then I read that, um, was that they both see this, this m- monumental shift in something happening at the cross, right? And they both call it incarnation. And they both come to it through language. So anyway, I just thought that was really interesting. No, I, I think it is. I mean, it because I, that that's another thing that's really important to me is like, and why Barfield I think has been illuminating for me is one, one of the things that, that, that for me always is still a struggle. And I think, you know, pretty much any um, modern person, you know, living in the 21st century has, if you, if you try to talk to them about religious ideas or about God or, you know, any, any sort of, there's always this, this presumed problem that everybody points to immediately, which is this problem of evil and suffering and pain and all that. Yeah. Right. And, and for me, Barfield offers a story around around why 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 there is this necessity for this these these very long time spans where we have this historical drama unfolding that that there's something actually being accomplished in all of it well i think Um, evolution of consciousness is metanoia right yeah well, because I think when we look back at history, we, we, we have such, and, and Barfield points this out over and over again, like we, we tend to just like put ourselves back in their perspective, like, which yeah. is why we're off, oftentimes so judgmental about like, oh, they did X and Y and Z. It's like, um, you think you would have done differently back then? You think you would have been the, the superhuman that just like goes against the tide? No, yeah. you're only saying what you're saying today because it's within the, yeah. the mainstream of cultural thought in your time. And you're just, right. you're just, you know, mindlessly spouting it. You're not, you yeah. know, the, these people also lived in a cultural, you know, context, context that was completely different than you. And you think you would not have been influenced by that. Um, but anyway, like he, 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 he sees that there's this sort of thing that's being accomplished. And, you know, when, when Peterson talks about, you know, the biblical series and goes into Genesis, like he, he looks at like, you know, again, trying to take a psychological perspective on things rather than um, more of a, a, a traditional, you know, Christian perspective. He sees that what's what's happening in the fall is is this awakening to consciousness, mm-hmm. you know, which mm-hmm. presumably had to had to occur at some historical moment in the past. Right, and um, you know, like I'm I'm just thinking about. Um, I'm thinking about this metanoia because it's it's been something that you know to me that is the journey that we're on as as individuals and as as a human race right it's this evolution of our consciousness it's this renewing of our mind right which is what metanoia means but it comes through you know the word metanoia is this is the word translated in the in the Bible as repentance in the New Testament. And we think of repentance as 
oh, I have to write a list of my sins and then I have to go through them and I have to, you know, say them out loud and say, I'm sorry, right? I repent. But repentance is only possible if you have a history, right? You, you can't repent of something before you've done it. <laughs> you, it has to have happened. So this renewing of the mind, it has to happen on a journey because you have to be able to look back and say, oh, this is where the tides ch changed. This is where the renewing of my mind began. It's like Bulgakov saying, you know, I stood in front of the picture, that icon of the Theotokos and something shifted, right? That's the beginning of metanoia, it's repentance, uh, you know? Yeah. And, and the story the, of the yeah. incarnation and the cross is that this, this, this journey, this process is so important that even the only sinless one, the very perfect man has to go through it as well. It's not, you know, while, while we link death to original sin and all this, these things, um, and obviously there's, there's all sorts of mistakes you can make in the world that lead, you know, more immediately to one's demise. Like it's, there's, there's this, this rescuing of death as um, while it still has this, this, all this negativity, there's something beautiful that's been imbued in death itself through, through yes. what, what Jesus does. And we, I think it's, it's something that's so far culturally a field from where we are at um, that it's not something we can meditate on too much because it's, it's something we kind of, need to be confronted with, uh, you know, almost minute by minute, you know, because so much is, is tempting us to construe of, uh, of it completely in a completely upside down way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's just everywhere, you know, <clears throat> If you eat of the fruit, you will surely see death, you know, and that, and that's what we've done. Um, and of course we don't want to see it. So we put it as far away from us as we possibly can. And, um, and I think that's also why we have such an identity crisis in, in, in the world today, because, because if you don't want to die, then everything is, like Paul said, um, what's that verse, Michael? Um, everything is allowed, but not everything is expedient, something like that. Yeah, um, that's something where Paul, he's talking about, uh, I think it's yeah. maybe Corinthians somewhere. Yeah, and I just, I, I just think that the expediency in, in things, you know, should I or shouldn't I do this? Is this expedient? that really comes down to, do I need to die to this? <laughs> you know, like, do I need to let this go? Right. Or should I pursue it just for, you know, for whatever reasons. And um, oftentimes we pursue things because we just want them. You know, we want to satisfy some desire. Um, we want to experience some kind of pleasure and, um, and we don't want to die. Yeah. Well, do we want to read through any other quotes or you want to, we want to end it here and pick up again at another point? I think maybe we should end it. I should go. Um, and I should finish reading with him too. So I could actually contribute better. But there, yeah, there's so much stuff in here. Awesome. Well, I'll, I'll end the recording here. And, okay. Uh,